David Rocco, he is one of the founding members of the Friends of the Mount Beacon 8 organization, working to increase public awareness of the eight Navy veterans killed in two separate plane crashes on Mount Beacon. He's also co-author of The Indestructible Man. And uh, there's a lot of interesting parts of the story, including, uh, obviously, um, uh, really a legend here as it relates to service in the military. But before we get to that, Talk about how you came upon the story and then some of the strange coincidences attached to this because Mount Beacon, a place we know both pretty well here, I don't think many people realize how much history actually is attached to that mountain. Yeah, it is incredible because um, people don't realize the name itself came from the uh, Patriot fires from uh, the Revolutionary War because Washington was across the river in Newburgh, so anytime the British came up the river, they would light the fires to warn them so he could uh, get away, simply put. Uh, the other connection which I found out later on is because of those plane crashes, they were heading back to a base called Quantum Point, Rhode Island. That was the first naval base we had in the Revolutionary War. So that's the beginning of your connections you're yeah. talking about. Um, now, talk about how you stumbled upon, um, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get to this, this guy's story in a second, but how you stumbled upon a plane crash where, as you have said, the earth is still charred from that day. Well, my background after I retired from the New York City Housing Authority as a carpenter, I got hurt on the job back in 2001. I got involved with a project called Walkway Over the Hudson up in Poughkeepsie, New York. And to me, it was my first time into a project like that as a volunteer. It's a great idea. Eventually, we finally got it open in 2009. From there, I bounced over to a project called the Mount Beacon Fire Tower Restoration Project. And the funny thing is, the antenna transmission towers for this station yep. is on the other peak, on the north peak, the fire towers on the south peak. So from there, we renovated it maybe around uh, June of 2013. We had a grand, grand opening celebration. Pete Seeger was there, David Amram, a uh, fantastic storyteller by the name of Jonathan Cluck was there as well. And shortly after the celebration, ceremony, somebody said to me, you aware of the fact there was a plane crash in Mount Beacon? So I never knew about that, so I went to the internet and then I started to look through it, and I found out there was a plane crash, a Navy plane crash in 1945, of all days, November 11th. One of the six that day was a Navy legend by the name of Dixie Kiefer. Mm. Now, as people know, we'll talk about the book here, he achieved the nickname called the Indestructible Man, um, served in both world wars, um, and he, he earned the nickname here. Talk a little bit about this guy, uh, because as you found out, I know through it, Anyone that came in contact with him never forgot him, but literally 10 major wounds between World War I and II, and he was at some of the biggest date points uh, of, of the conflict, from the Takandaroga to, you know, Midway to, I mean, talk about this guy. I mean, it's amazing, his story. He was a remarkable person. The other thing that was remarkable about him, just to size up a second, is I can't believe how many people adored him because I met seven people that served underneath him on the U.S. Uh, Yorktown and the Ticonderoga three years later. But um, to survive the stuff that he went through, um, first in the USS Yorktown, he was executive officer in the Battle of Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway. He was the last person to jump off the Yorktown that sank. Um, it's a long story involved with that too, um, where he, when he went to save one of the men, the rope slipped in his hand, burned his hand down to the raw meat. He tried to lower himself, he fell off, hit the side of the deck, compound fracture of the ankle, fell down below 50, 60 feet. The guy that was in the basket, he grabbed him, put him with the uh, rescue craft, um, raft, and two, three guys there, he pushed everybody to a waiting uh, in a rescue ship. I mean, this guy's got a compound fracture of the leg, Fast forward a couple of years later, became the first, uh, became the first commanding officer of the USS Ticonderoga. Uh, that was the spring of 1944, January 21st, 1945, within an hour, two kamikaze attacks. He refused to leave the bridge to oversee the fire um, control and then to make sure every man on the ship was taken care of before him. Stayed on that bridge for 12 hours before he finally agreed to come down. So several months later, in this award ceremony in Rockefeller Center, then Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal, said to him after reading all his background, about to present him with an award, he said, you're the indestructible man. By the way, was the Navy Secretary actually a Beacon native? That was the, that's the incredible thing, because six months later, he was killed in James Forrestal's hometown. 
Um, right. Another one of these crazy things that uh, connecting the dots, so to speak. Um, and it's just kind of draw me deeper and deeper into this. And as part of his heroism, um, he was aboard a ship, um, and his actions saved a lot of guys' um, lives that day because even though he was severely wounded, he turned the ship a certain way that, as a consequence, really saved a lot of American lives. Well, that was the thing. Both on the, on the Yorktown, um, it seems he had a lot of free will and free reign on it uh, because I guess the, uh, a lot of times the commanders let the executive officers really take charge because they're training them to take over their own command. So when he got onto Yorktown and then the Ticonderoga, what he did was after both attacks, he listed them. I took on water on purpose to list them sideways so the fire and the burning planes would fall off the ship itself and then list them back, you know, balance them out. Uh, to have that presence of mind in the middle of all this heat of battle, and you know, I mean, it's just God helped those mm. people that went through all that. Now, you talked, as you said, uh, seven different people who served for him, and you said when you'd bring his name up, uh, these guys would get choked up many, many years later. Um, during my research, I reached out to the USS Ticonderoga Veterans Association made, uh, group, and I asked them if they'd be helpful with us with any information they had. Yeah, sure, and they sent me two big things that were incredible help. My uh, fellow author, Al Don Keefe, and I, and that's another story that yeah. you'll enjoy. But um, they say, by the way, at the end of May, we're going to have a Veterans Association reunion in Tampa. We'd like you to come down and meet people and give a presentation yourself. So I said, sure, it'd be great. So I went down there. There were four people at the reception itself. The fifth one was home bedridden, and they said, you have to go see him. So they drove me out 45 miles from Tampa to meet him uh, again. Yeah, the Navy cap on like they all do. Had certificates and medals on the table from James Forrestal and uh, FDR and Harry Truman. Wow. I mean, it's just powerful stuff. And every time I mentioned the name Dixie Kiefer, tears would start coming down his face. And it's just, I've never seen a boss so well liked by so many people. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I didn't like oh. too many of my bosses. But uh, it was awesome to see that. And sadly, he passed away. I only found out the other day, a week later. Well, least, I'm sure it meant a lot, obviously. Uh, that memory and um, just on a sidebar I've gotten to deal with the, a lot of folks from the greatest generation we went back to Omaha and Utah Beach um, for the guys that were there D-Day 55 years later we took them back and you know it is the maybe defining moments of their lives what those guys went through and how they speak with reverence to their commanders I can I can certainly appreciate that but so your arc from guy just you know, caring about a project, the Mount Beacon comes across an amazing story, then says more people should know about this story, and then you come across, as you said, an author who has a history of writing books about military history, and even he was, I mean, some of this stuff's almost too hard to believe, right? And, and, and the name almost writes itself, The Indestructible Man. Well, when I reached out to Don Keith, it was because I bought one of his books out of BJ's, uh, there was two books, actually, The Undersea Warrior and The Ship That Wouldn't Die. So I was trying to figure out which book I was going to start with first. I went to the author's notes, and Don described how he goes about writing the book. And then because of the fact that back when Brokoff did his book, there were 1,000 men dying a day. Now it's down to 300 because there's only 600,000 left. So he said we have to preserve their stories because once they're gone, they're gone. And at that point, he said, I created a website, One Million Untold Stories. So if you have information, somebody in the family or friend, tell them to contact uh, the website and share the story. Uh, and if you have a project idea that's never been written about before, contact me. So I said, well, here's my chance. So because so many people had told me with the hikes that we had in ceremonies, you got to write a book. You have to write the book. Uh, Senator Gillibrand, U.S. Senator Gillibrand, helped me out. Again, the personnel records of all eight men. So I really got a background of everybody. So everything was on the table. So I wrote him the note and without these specifics. And less than three hours later, he wrote back. Mm -hmm. He goes, I like it, but I need more. Just don't worry about me stealing your idea. Uh, because I have too much of a reputation to maintain. And, and by the way, he's in the, one of his books is being made into a major motion picture here as right. we speak. So, uh, so then you get in the material, and now this thing's turning into a book, and, and who knows what happens after that, right? Well, I personally could have wrote the book. That was the one thing I didn't like about what the Times writer wrote in the New York Times last week. Dave Rockland couldn't write. I could write, but what I wanted to do, being a carpenter and a captain maker, I wanted the best possible product. I wanted somebody that had that background. 
So when I sent down all the material by the end of late January, early February, he sent me the first five chapters by the beginning of March. I knew I had it right because yeah. it was magnificent to see what he did. It, it, and I got to tell you, you know, for most people who think they've heard every story, you haven't until you've seen this one. And, and, I, and I'm going to look forward to going through this book myself here. Um, like I said, the guy was eyewitness to so many major things. And then, as you said, to quote you, what a kick in the ass to go through two world wars and to die in a regular flight, um, you know, going home. So uh, anyway, an amazing story. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. I appreciate Pleasure. the time. Thank you Absolutely. for having me here.